Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For this week's episode, I spoke to the editor-in-chief of the magazine Mental Floss, which just celebrated its 20-year anniversary. In the spirit of Mental Floss's 20th anniversary, let me give you a few pieces of trivia about the magazine. It made a cameo in two episodes of Friends and an episode of Netflix's The OA. It started as a print magazine, but discontinued its print edition in 2016. In addition to its web content, it produces several popular video series on YouTube. And in 2018, it was acquired by Minute Media, a conglomerate that mostly consists of sports media sites. Suffice it to say, the mental floss of 2020 looks a lot different than when it was a magazine published out of the dorm room of two Duke University students. I recently sat down with its editor-in-chief, Aaron McCarthy, to talk about its post-print strategy and why a sports media company was interested in a publisher that specializes in history trivia. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk about what goes into making this podcast. First, I have to find a guest and convince them to come on the show. Next comes a pre-interview that allows me to take detailed notes about the guest's background. On the day of the interview, I go through these notes and conduct other research as I pull together a list of topics I want to hit during the interview. Then, of course, there's the interview itself, which can take up to an hour. From there, I edit the audio, write an intro script, splice it all together, and then distribute it to podcast apps. The work doesn't stop there, though. I then take the transcripts from the interview and convert them into an article that I publish to my website. The point I'm trying to make is that this isn't just a show where I jump into an interview without any preparation and then simply post the audio. There are hours of painstaking work, and you've probably noticed that I don't have any advertising. The only way to support the work I do here is by subscribing to my Substack newsletter. Not only will it ensure the continuation of this podcast, but you get lots of awesome media industry analysis delivered straight to your inbox. Go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Aaron. Hey, Aaron, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So you're the editor-in-chief of Mental Floss. Can we start with giving listeners a little bit of context as to what Mental Floss is? Like, it it started as a print magazine, right? Yes. It actually was founded in a Duke University dorm in 2001 by two college students. And uh, since then, it has evolved into a website for curious minds where you can basically find, uh, you know, answers to life's big questions or really fun and strange facts or interesting stories that you didn't know you needed to know. Uh, And since we started, the website has been visited by a billion people, which is wild. Uh huh. So t- tell me a little bit more, more content focus. So like it's it's not it's not a newsy type magazine. A lot of its content is very evergreen. How would you describe like from in like an elevator pitch what what its kind of worldview is? Yeah. So basically, we are looking, as you said, at kind of evergreen stuff. We're not. Um. You know, we do cover like newsy stories, but there are version of newsy stories. They're quirky. Um, they're interesting. Um, so we're not part of like that news rat race, which is nice because I do think people kind of, uh, look at mental floss as a bit of an escape from that. Um, and, you know, so we're focusing on like weird historical stories and, uh, you know, fun facts and, and things of that nature. Speaking of fun facts, I, I read that, uh, Mental Floss, the print magazine, made a cameo on Friends. It did. It's actually been, I think it was on Friends twice. Um, and it's been on a bunch of other TV shows, um, including The OA and The Magicians. So, um, yeah, for whatever reason, we've got fans in Hollywood, which is which is nice. Oh, wow. Well, when I do my OA re- rewatch, I'm going to have to look out for that. I don't think I noticed it. What I found was, um, you know, I, I saw that. Um, cause I watched the OA when it came out. And then later on when I was researching, um, you know, some stuff for mental Floss's 20th anniversary, I came across like a whole, uh, YouTube video that based a theory around the issue of the magazine that appeared in the OA. So it really, I mean, people took that show very seriously and I was extremely delighted to have found that YouTube video. Yeah, I'm definitely going to watch that when we end this. Uh, so when, it, but it's no longer as a print version. W- right. When did it end? When did it end its print edition? Uh, the magazine folded in 2016. 
and focused. Oh. We we switched our focus to um, digital only, but in 2019 we did do a special uh, a special edition print uh, issue, which was so much fun to work on. And then it got acquired somewhat recently by Minute Media. I've had, yes. I think I had the president on or CEO or something on my podcast several months ago, mm-hmm. which it traditionally specializes in sports media. Why do you think it was interested in mental floss? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, at the time I didn't really think too much about why they were interested in us. Um, I think probably they were looking to kind of expand a bit beyond sports. Um, into areas like entertainment, like lifestyle. Um, and you know, we check those boxes a bit. So, uh, I, I I think that was, that was their reasoning. Um, and since then they've acquired, um, excuse me, fan sided, which also has a strong entertainment component. Um, but you know, beyond that, I think, um, the thing that kind of unites all of the minute media brands is this, uh, excitement and this passion for whatever it is, um, you know, that the site is covering. So for many of the sites, it's sports. For us, it's learning and it's curiosity. Um, So I think that's why they were interested uh, in Mental Floss. How did you first end up working for the magazine? So I started my career uh, many, many moons ago um, at Popular Mechanics, where I was uh, assistant to the editor-in-chief, and then I worked my way up to associate editor, and I covered everything from, um, you know, natural disasters to bridge engineering to um, uh, the science behind sci-fi movies and things like that. Um, And it just got to a point where there wasn't anywhere for me to move up. So I started kind of looking around and uh, I found just a job listing for mental floss. And it struck me, you know, as a place where like popular mechanics, if you were really curious, you would be rewarded. Um, So I applied and I was hired uh, in 2012 as the deputy editor and only the second digital employee. So back then the operation was very, very small. Um, It's expanded a bit since then. Yeah, and then you just what worked your way up to editor in chief. When did you take the top job? Uh, twenty seventeen, mm-hmm. which is wild. It was so long ago. I can't. <laughs> it's what is time? I don't even yeah. know. <laughs> uh, so as we mentioned, kind of the the main focus of mental floss. It's not really too tied to the news cycle. Like, what do you like about that dynamic? Like, I imagine if you're working at the New York Times or Politico or something like that, you wake up every day and you sort of know what you're going to write about because it's something that's happening that day. Obviously, you have to kind of uh, ascribe importance to different things, um, but that's driving your kind of daily content cycle, whereas like you could literally focus on just about anything. No, I was looking through the Mental Floss website and and no topic is too obscure. I mean, I'm sure there are topics <laughs> that are too obscure, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what do, you, do you like that dynamic of, of like setting the agenda constantly? Oh, I mean, I love it. First of all, I think one of the fun things about Mental Floss and one of the most interesting things about Mental Floss that hasn't changed over 20 years is that, uh, you know, it was started as a way for people, the two co-founders, to just kind of explore the things that they were interested in. And that's still how we operate. Um, And so, you know, there's obviously planning that goes into, you know, stories we're working on and that we're going to run. But we are not tied to the news cycle. Um, You know, occasionally, like, we have an editorial calendar full of weird holidays. And so... Um, you know, if we have something pegged to that, we will obviously run it on that day or shortly before. Um, but otherwise, you know, we kind of take our time with the things that we're working on so that we can, you know, really get them right. And, uh, this is kind of a long rambling answer. My apologies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you know, it's just, it's really, it's really fun to follow your curiosity to wherever it takes you. And I think- think Do you think it's harder to create like a devoted audience around it, though, since it's not like around a niche and you're writing about all kinds of different subjects? Well, I mean, uh, not necessarily. So I feel like Mental Floss obviously has a very strong built in fan base that was really nurtured uh, by the print magazine. Um, But the fact that we cover so much, I think, is actually a strength 
um, because a lot of the things that we're covering are things that people are searching for anyway. Um, so, you know, if you're Googling for the answer to some question, there's a good chance that mental floss is going to pop up in search and then you're going to come to visit mental floss and then hopefully, you know, you're going to see something else that interests you while you're there and then you're just going to keep following your curiosity down the rabbit hole. Um, and then before you know it, hopefully we've got a fan. Well, you mentioned that you do a lot of stuff that's tied around holidays, mm -hmm. anniversaries. Like today is Do National Donut Day. Here's how the modern donut was invented. I mean, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Or oh, we do this have that piece. <laughs> that piece this is exists. yeah, mm -hmm. and this is it's 30 years since so uh, DB Cooper jumped out of that plane. Mm -hmm. Here's a something stuff like that. How do you how do you think or how does your content team plan around that? Like, are you planning those pieces out? far in advance? Like, how do, you, how do you think around the anniversaries and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. So a lot of times, um, we will have covered it already. So we will bring back those stories, we'll clean them up, we'll make sure that they, you know, look nice. Because one of the other things about having been around for 20 years is that some of your stories, you know, maybe have a little wonky code. So you got to go in and clean them up. Maybe the photos aren't really nice. So we make sure that they look very nice. Um, you know, and then we bring them back to the homepage. So there's that. While we are doing that, if we notice, you know, maybe there's something that we missed, maybe there's another story we'd like to tell, um, you know, we'll take that on at the same time. Um, so you bring up uh, National Donut Day. We have a lot about the history of it. Um, you know, I assigned, I guess this is a slight spoiler since National Donut Day isn't for another month, but, um, <laughs> you know, we're looking at a list of uh, donuts from around the world for National Donut Day this year because we didn't have that. So we were like, we should do that. Um, it's going to make me really hungry. I'm very much looking forward to reading it. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, how does that help you? I mean, so it's national. So like National Donut Com Day comes around. And are people thinking like they're seeing like some kind of tweet or something saying it's National Donut Day, and then maybe mm -hmm. they're go they're going to Google to find out, or like, like why why do you think that people why why do people visit articles about that kind of content? I guess I'm not asking this question very well, but like, it, it, do you see like a huge surge in traffic to your older National Donut Day traffic like articles on National Donut Day? Like, how much interest is in there there? Yeah, I mean, it really, again, it depends on on what the story is. Um, but, you know, whenever we're bringing stuff back to the homepage, we're also tweeting it. Um, I also just think because of social media, people are more aware of the holidays like that. So, yeah, they'll go and they'll search. And if they find us, you know, they'll they'll come and uh, and visit the page. Uh -huh. And like, so you spend a lot of time, do you like refreshing older articles? Like I know that Google rewards content that's updated and refreshed. Is that like a part of like your, your weekly workflow or how, how do you think about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, for us, it's just always real. And again, because we have so much, so much stuff, uh, dating back 20 years, um, there are very few things it feels like we haven't covered. So yeah, I mean, it's totally part of our part of our strategy to go back through and, and clean up those stories and, and bring them back to the homepage and make sure they're in tip top shape. Mm -hmm. And if you already have, let's just, let's stay on the example of national donut day. <laughs> if you already have an article about national donut day, are you still thinking, okay, what's a fresh angle we can do to this to create a new article about it? Or are you more just rely like we already did that. Let's just point people back to that old article. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it depends. Um, for Donut Day, there was that very obvious hole. Uh, to bad yeah. pun, bad yeah. pun. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we went with that. But, you know, I think the other thing is we also have a pool of freelance writers, um, you know, who are coming to us with new and fresh angles on things all the time. So if they bring us something that we haven't covered um, or, you know, it's a different look at something that we've already covered, um, you know, and we like that idea, we'll assign it to them and run that as well. For like your historical uh, stuff, are you, are your writers like, are they, how much are they doing like firsthand research, original documents, stuff like that versus like taking stuff from like a biography that was written about someone? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, um, we do a lot of research, a lot, a lot of research. Um, 
And what we find really depends, again, on the subject. I feel like I'm saying it depends a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, like when you're writing about the founding fathers, there are obviously a lot of documents that have been digitized um, that you can go and take a look at that are primary documents. Um, so, you know, for that, obviously, we're going and we're looking into all of those things. Um, sometimes we're going to a biography. Um you know, so it just it kind of depends on, on what the subject is um, and, and what we're able to dig up. So like I a lot of what you publish could be almost categorized as trivia, like the kind mm -hmm. of stuff you would come you would uh, have be asked about if you were going to a trivia night at your local bar. I saw that you do have like a quizzes section on your website. What's your what's your strategy around quizzes? Um. Our strategy is just finding cool and fun things to to throw together. Um, you know, it's we have certain categories that we want to hit. Um, so like animals, um, general knowledge, um, movies and entertainment. Um, and those are the ones that we that we really capitalize on. Um, but they're all done in house by our staff um, and they come up with all of the ideas um, and put them together. So it's, you know, a lot of times that something like that is, um, is spurred by, I don't know, a news story that they've worked on or a list that a writer has worked on, um, you know, that kind of gives them a kernel of an idea where they can say, ah, I'm going to take this thing and turn it into a quiz. Yeah. The one I took today was, uh, which which superhero came first in the comics and it, mm. it'll sh it'll show you two two names and you have to guess which one came first i think i got 12 out of 15 wow um, <laughs> is there anyone at mental floss or minute media whose job it is to like mine the website analytic data for deep insights about user behavior like the reason i ask that is that i've seen some publishers say that readers who do crosswords or quizzes on a news site are much more likely to engage with that site in all sorts of ways what how how does the quiz quizzes play into your kind of audience development strategy um i mean i think for us we we rank really highly uh on the search term quizzes um so you know, that is kind of our thinking behind building the quiz section is that we want to bring more people to the quiz section through search. Um, the company certainly does have a whole team that that mines Google Analytics um, for insights. Um, I don't necessarily know that we've looked into engagement based on quizzes. So mm. now I might have to do that. Yeah, now you've given I mean, me an idea. I mean, obviously, it's becoming like a huge thing. Like, you know, the I don't know how much you follow the media industry news, like around, for instance, mm -hmm. like like the New York Times, like their crosswords puzzle things are a huge business driver now because like just those users are super engaged. They subscribe both to the crosswords and to the paper. Mm -hmm. The New Yorker has found it launched a crossword section and it found that users who play its crosswords are much likely to become paying subscribers, different stuff like that. So I didn't know if you've, you've seen anything like that in the data, but it sounds like nobody's shown you a stat specifically showing that. Not yet, but now I'm going to look into it. So <laughs> So tell me about the YouTube channel. Like it was first run by Hank Green, right? Like he's now a famous YouTuber. He he kind of came up with the initial strategy for the Mental Floss YouTube channel. Yeah, so that was actually um, developed in in conjunction with um, Mangesha Ticketer and Will Pearson, who were the co-founders of Mental Floss. And, and John Green actually wrote for the magazine like well before he was, you know, a famous author. So that's pretty cool. Um and they partnered with uh, John and Hank to create the channel. Um, they stuck around through the end of 2018, I want to say. And then we took it over and brought it all in-house. And now you see a lot of my face on the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. And you guys like actually have specific shows on YouTube, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we have The List Show, which is kind of like our, our original uh, YouTube vehicle. Um, we have Misconceptions. We have throwback and we have food history. Mm -hmm. So misconceptions, it's like seven misconceptions, science misconceptions or something like that. It's things yeah. that people think are true that might not actually be true. Yeah. So we're looking at like misconceptions about the 1920s or misconceptions about airplanes, things, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And you, it's like a repeatable format where you have an actual host. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, both food history and misconceptions are hosted by Justin Dodd, who's one of our video producers, and then I host Throwback and The List Show.
And uh, like, what's your, what's your, how long is the average video? Um, it varies widely. Um, most of them tend to be in kind of that like 12 minute range. Um, occasionally we will do list of facts of a hundred and then you're making like a TV show, which is wild to shoot because it takes such a long time. Um, yeah. and those end up being like 30 to 40 minutes. So it's, uh, they're intense. How did the pandemic alter your video video production? Oh, I shot here in my house, <laughs> which is not what I was expecting to do um, at all. Uh, and my husband helps me. And thank goodness for that, because I don't know that I'd be able to do it by myself. Um, but yeah, we pulled all the equipment uh, into our apartments. And, you know, every couple of weeks, we'll, we'll bulk shoot some episodes. And then I send them over to our video team and they cut them together. Um, yeah, it's, I never, never in a million years expected to be bringing the YouTube audience into my house, but, um, we worked it out and I, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's been great. How much do you think about YouTube and video being like an extension of mental floss versus it's being its own, like some of these, some of these, uh, media companies, their video business is so mature that like it's its own separate entity or you think like a Vox media or a Buzzfeed, is this mainly just kind of like a, a side project for mental floss or is this becoming like a huge media arm in its own right? Um, you know, I think anything that we do, we want it to be an extension of what we're doing on the site. We want it to feel like it's part of the Mental Floss brand. Um, and I think that has become especially true since we brought it in-house. Um, you know, previously we were weighing in on ideas and scripts and things like that. But, you know, we weren't heavily involved in production the way we are now. Um, so, you know, I think we do do some things a little bit differently because our YouTube audience is slightly different than our, than our site audience. Our site audience is basically split 50, 50, but YouTube tends to skew a little bit more male. So, you know, we're, that's always in the back of our minds when we're thinking about topics for certain shows. Um, but one of the things that we do, um, because all of the scripts are written in house by our staff, um, we actually will cross post those will repurpose the scripts for those videos and post them on the site, um, you know, so that we can make sure we're getting the most bang for our buck there. Um, you know, so it's all, it's all very intertwined. Are you just posting video content on YouTube or are you seeing any traction on other platforms as well? So we do different uh, things for different uh, social channels. So for YouTube is, is a hundred percent the main focus. Um, we do things for, um, Instagram, but there it's, it's more like the things that, um, that resonate with people are like profiles of visual artists, um, or, you know, stuff that people find soothing. For example, we did a video on a person who is bringing back wax seals, um, and the whole video is literally just this woman pressing wax. Um, it's incredibly satisfying and it went crazy. People loved it um, on Facebook, on Instagram. It was a huge hit for us. Um, and then, you know, we're obviously doing TikTok. We're on TikTok now. Um, and the approach there is slightly different because what we're finding, and I don't know if this is true for everyone else, but you tend to see the most success when you jump on those viral trending topics. So even though we have, um, you know, we're providing like fun little, here's what I learned today kind of videos, um, our take on, on the kind of viral things tend to do the best there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it seems like your, um, your holiday and anniversary content would do really well on TikTok. Like here's five, five quick facts about donuts or something like that. It's national donuts day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we haven't tried too much of that. I think we've done a little bit. Um, I think our biggest hit so far has been a video about the last words of famous people. Um, that really took off. Um, we just put up a TikTok of uh, old timey slang terms for sex that I think is doing pretty well. And TikTok is so funny because <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit outside what I would say the target demographic of TikTok is. Um, and so our, our social media editor has to explain things to us in a way that makes me feel like my mother 
you know, it makes me feel so old. But she'll be like, you know, I can't say sex. I have to spell it segs because, uh, you know, otherwise TikTok will flag you. And I was like, oh, is that why people do that? It just like blew my mind. I had no idea why people were spelling sex, S-E-G-G-S. Anyway. <laughs> and then for, for the Instagram, it sounds like it's more focused on visually appealing content versus YouTube, which is more dialogue focused because you're assuming a lot of people are seeing it on like silent autoplay or mm-hmm. something like that. Exactly. And I will also say um, that's just our video strategy. Like obviously for Instagram, we are also focused on creating, we, we drop facts in there and stuff all the time, you know, so it's, so it's like, uh, again, highly, highly visual because that's what Instagram is, but it's not, uh, it's not just videos there. What are you doing in the podcast space? So we have a partnership with iHeartMedia, iHeartRadio, um, and we've created two podcasts with them. The first uh, was History versus Theodore Roosevelt, um, which I hosted because I'm a TED head and just had to do it. Um, and each episode of that podcast basically looked at a challenge that he faced, um, and it was built around a theme. Um, and the second podcast we did with them was called The Quest for the North Pole, which was hosted by our science editor, Kat Long, um, who has an ancestor who was actually um, a whaler um, and explored, did some Arctic exploration, I believe. So, um, you know, she was she was the person to dig into that because she had a very personal connection to it. And that was, um, you know, a long form narrative podcast that was really yeah, fun. But- yeah, both of those are scripted podcasts, right? Yes, correct. Uh huh. So why focus on that, which are heavy production values, more expensive? You only get one season, so it's hard to build up an advertising base. Why focus on that versus like more conversational podcasts? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the deeply reported and, and highly produced podcasts are the ones that I really enjoy listening to. Um, I just find it more interesting that you can hear a story that way. Um, I do like conversational podcasts too, but you know, to me it felt like we could really do something very cool if we were working within this sort of like deeply reported, um, highly produced space. So I, you know, that could change in the future. Um, but really we did it because those are the, the kinds of podcasts that we like and that excite us. And what did iHeartMedia bring to the table? What was the nature of the par- partnership? Well, it was so funny because um, when Will and Mangesh left Mental Floss, they went to How Stuff Works, and then How Stuff Works was acquired by iHeartRadio, and so they came to us and they were like, "Do you want to make podcasts with us?" And we were like, "Yeah," and um, you know, obviously their reach is incredible. Um, I don't think it gets better. Um, than that. They also have incredible production teams. So, you know, if we were producing a podcast on our own, we probably wouldn't be able to make the kind of podcasts we wanted to make because we just don't have that know-how or those resources. Um, So the production team that we work with there is fantastic. Um, You know, and then of course they have a sales team that's uh, very experienced in this space and they bring a lot to the table in that regard as well. You're getting into book publishing as well, right? Yes. Tell me about that. So I'm really excited because, um, you know, Mental Floss have published a number of books in the past, but by the time I joined in 2012, that was kind of um, over. It was not something that we were really doing anymore. Um, So when we were acquired, we were actually approached by a company called Indelible Editions, and they're book packagers, and they've got a lot of expertise in this space. And so we worked with them. Uh, to kind of come up with some concepts. And then we ended up selling those concepts to uh, Weldon Owen International. So we're putting out our first, uh, well, our first new book (laughs) uh, this year. It actually comes out on May 25th and it's called The Curious Reader. And uh, it's basically just all kinds of weird and fun facts about classic novels and, you know, your favorite novelists. So um, among the things you're going to find out are like which author kept her dead husband's heart after he died um, and took it with her everywhere. Uh, Which author was totally obsessed with his chimney, um, which is a weird, a very weird thing. Um, And uh, you'll also find out which author told people she was a witch. So it's full of all kinds of fun things 
like that. So we're, we're really excited about it. The book is just beautiful. Um, and uh, we're really proud of it. Is that something where you like commissioned a writer to, to write that? Or how did that work? No. So we actually used uh, a lot of the content that was on the site. Uh, and then in-house, we wrote a bunch of new material for it. So it's a blend of things that you'll find on mentalfloss.com and then new things that we've written specifically for the book. Do you think like books can be a scalable part of like mental floss where you're hiring a book editor and commissioning work? Or like, do you think this is all always going to be kind of like a side project? I mean, I would love to do more here. Um, I think there's a lot um, of ideas that we have and content that we have that we could repackage into new books. Um, since this new one is our kind of our first foray into this area in quite some time. I think we'll have to see how it pans out before we make any decisions there. But, um, you know, we're already working on our second book with Weldon Owen and Indelible. Um, and hopefully there's going to be a lot more in the future. Um, but you know, it's like, it's a new challenge too. I had never worked on a book before. So, um, I'm learning all kinds of things. It's really, it's really fascinating. And you're like, it's a relatively small team of only like 15 people. So it's not like you can do huge investments and in speculative mm -hmm. projects. Like you have to be very economical and how you choose to allocate your resources. For sure. There are 11 of us, including our social team and our video team. So really, um, but everybody chips in, you know, I mean, it's like our social editor wrote stuff for the book. Our video producers wrote stuff for the book. So, um, you know, we want to give everybody the opportunity to participate in those kinds of things if they want to. But yeah, we're, we're a very small team. Um, so we have to pick and choose pretty carefully um, and not be afraid to say no to things if they don't feel right for us. So I know you work on the editorial side. Could you give us at least a little context of like how Mental Floss makes money? Like it, there's no like paid subscription or anything like that, right? No, 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 nothing, nothing like that. Um, you know, as you said, I'm definitely firmly an editorial, but, um, you know, in a general sense, I think what we find is that you want to diversify um, your revenue streams as much as possible, right? So that's, that's what we try to do. So, um, you know, direct and programmatic advertising, uh, are both on mental floss. We've got e-commerce. Um, you know, we've got editorial partnerships like, uh, like the, um, special edition magazine we did with, which was, uh, in partnership with the paper and packaging board. Um, you know, and so we're always just looking at, uh, things like that so that, you know, our revenue streams are diversified and that we're hopefully reaching new audiences through those opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. For any of the e-commerce or like, do you have your editorial team creating any con content around that? Like lists of, you know, interesting books to buy or different stuff like that? Oh, for sure. I mean, I know that there are some places that keep it kind of separate, but I think for me, again, it's really important to me that anything that goes up on Mental Floss feels like it belongs on the site. Um, and for me, there's not a way to do that without editorial being involved. So um, you know, it's a bit of a blend for us. There are some writers who work across the Minute Media brands, uh, and then our staff writers will write some e-commerce content as well. And again, we have freelancers who will pitch in um, on that. But, you know, anything we put on the site, we want to make sure it feels like it belongs on Mental Floss. And so everything is vetted by our editorial team. Everything is edited by our editorial team. Mm -hmm. What's an example of like a quintessential... Uh mental floss article that includes some kind of e-commerce in it um oh gosh anything involving a funko pop 100 percent is a, an e-commerce story we're gonna put up on mental I floss i don't know what that is <laughs> oh they're like um these little pop culture figurines um and they have superheroes they have historical figures um there's a bob ross one and we love bob ross like we love Bob Ross. Uh -huh. So anything that's like a Funko Pop thing um, will have an e-commerce element. We will do a lot of reading lists as well. So for example, we have a summer reading list coming up and that's e-commerce and that's all written, um, you know, by our team and, you know, some freelancers who work on e-commerce content for us. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's anything, anything Baby Yoda. Sorry, the uh -huh. child. Uh-huh. 
um, is big for us. So like that same kind of pop culture, pop culture kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, strange tea accessories, accessories for drinking your tea, something that really resonates with our readers for whatever reason. Um, uh-huh. So those so, are all so, kinds so, of stories. So no like mainstream products, more kind of quirky gifts, like things that people might want to do to entertain themselves, different stuff like that. Well, I think it's it's you can kind of divide it into two categories, right? It's the quirky stuff. And then there's also stuff that's going to allow our readers to live their lives better or smarter in some way. Um, so, you know, for example, you're going to find some robot vacuum content uh, on Mental Floss. Um, but, you know, we're going to try to break down for you why this is going to make your life easier or how it's going to make your life better or smarter. Um, so I would say that the main... Those are the two main categories, quirky and helping you to live a smarter life. Mm -hmm. And are you just like throwing in Amazon links or is there someone at Minute Media who's like going and finding the best like partnership or whatever e-commerce link to throw in there? Yeah, I mean, we are part of a number of affiliate programs. And so, you know, we're not just using Amazon. It's it's a lot of places. Um, Mm -hmm. That's I'm not involved in the day to day of that, so I can't really talk too much about it. But I yeah. do know that there are a ton, a ton of affiliate programs we're a part of. So it's your job to just create really good editorial content. It's their job to find out what's the best way to what where to point people to, so that you know you get a cut of that revenue. Well, it's it's mostly our editor, um, our special projects ed- editor, who is you know on mental floss, who's vetting all that content. So. Um, you know, everything goes through him, Mm -hmm. everything. Um, And, you know, occasionally people will bring things to him. Um, And occasionally, by the way, we'll cover products that aren't on any affiliate network just because we think they're cool. Um, So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's his job to kind of do the vetting and then collectively we make sure that it's the best editorial content it can be. Mm-hmm. And did, did, am I wrong in thinking that uh, Mental Floss just passed some kind of major anniversary or something like that? You are not. We actually, this very month, are turning 20, which is uh-huh. wild. Yeah. Uh, wild. Is there anything special you're doing around that? So we actually have a few a few things that we're doing. Um, we have some kind of social media prompts that we're running by people to see, you know, what's their favorite fact that they learned from mental floss, things of that nature. Um, We have a bunch of content planned around it. So we have looked back at some of like the best historical discoveries of the past 20 years since we were founded, um, words that have made it into the dictionary since we were founded. Um, um, We've got, uh, I'm trying to think of what's, what's come out already and (laughs) And what hasn't? Um, my brain is like, don't say the things that haven't come out yet. Well, it'll be a few weeks before this uh, episode hits. So. Okay. Um, the one that's one that's coming out on May twentieth is novelty foods um, of the past twenty years. So those are all things that they're coming out on the twentieth of the month. They're lists of twenty, um, and they're just kind of like fun, quirky lists that kind of take a look back. Beyond that, we're doing other lists of 20 that are just kind of like really fun and and weird um, that aren't necessarily a recap of the past 20 years, but are just kind of like fun lists of, of 20. So we're really hitting that 20 thing hard. <laughs> um, you know, and in a normal year, we'd probably have a nice big party, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, we won't be doing that. So maybe we'll do it for when we turn 21. Where is the office based? Uh, in Midtown, Manhattan, near Penn Station. Oh. Okay, yeah. Aaron. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? They can find me personally at Aaron C. McCarthy on Twitter. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.